Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. In this conversation, we welcome Eugene Perrier back to the podcast to talk about the recently published book, The Black Belt Thesis, A Reader, which was compiled by the Black Belt Thesis Study Group and features a forward by Eugene Perrier. The Reader itself was published by 1804 Books, and they have published a lot of really good stuff recently that I wanted to take a moment to shout out. They recently, along with the Palestinian Youth Movement, translated and published The Trinity of Fundamentals, which hopefully we'll be hosting a conversation on at some point soon. They also published a translation of Ghassan Kanafani's The Revolution of 1936 to 1939 in Palestine, and of course, the collection of Hugo Chavez speeches that we discussed with Manolo de los Santos last year and much more. So I just say that to say, if you go to pick up this book from them, that there's a bunch of other really good stuff that you can grab while you're there. Eugene Perrier is a journalist, activist, politician, and host on Breakthrough News. He is a founding member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and is the author of Shackled and Chained, Mass Incarceration in Capitalist America. In this discussion, we ask Eugene to contextualize the origins of the Black Belt thesis, to discuss some of the articulations and development of the thesis as undertaken by Comintern and the CPUSA. We discuss some of the organizing implications of it, its role in the development of the U.S. communist movement, particularly with regard to black people, and the challenging of the problem of white racism as it exists within the history of the U.S. left, and white workers as well. Also, Eugene discusses the centrality of national oppression within the political economy of U.S. capitalism. Along the way, we talk about some of the contributions from figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, Harry Haywood, Louise Thompson Patterson, Claudia Jones, and others. A couple of other things I wanted to quickly shout out is that we're hosting a lot more conversations over on our YouTube page recently the majority of which we have not had the time to release as audio episodes. We will link those in the show notes, but you can also just find us on YouTube at Millennials Are Killing Capitalism and check out our work there. The other thing I want to note is that we do have another round of study groups starting back up. For this cycle, we will be reading Orasami Burton's amazing book, Tip of the Spear, Black Radicalism, Prison Repression, and the Long Attica Revolt. I can't wait to read that text and discuss it with folks, so sign up for that if you're interested in it. It will be on Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, starting on April 17th. It is for patrons of the show, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And as always, the best way to support our work is to become a patron of the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. All right. So Eugene per year, welcome back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. We've had you on the show a couple of times, but it has also been a couple of years, maybe three years now since we've had you on. So we're excited to be in conversation with you again. Really appreciate all of the work that you do as an organizer, as a party member, and also the media work that you do with Breakthrough News. So we just want to shout that out to make sure people follow, check out Breakthrough News. It's a great source, especially for, you know, current events and news to stay on top of things from a radical left perspective, a socialist perspective, an anti-imperialist perspective. So thank you for all of that. And it's great to be in conversation with you again. No, it's really great to be here. Really appreciate y'all having me back. You know, great show. It's always an honor to be here. Thank you. So to start with, let's just talk about this book a little bit. So we're here to talk about a book that you, I assume, were key in putting together, but certainly a part of the process. You wrote the the introduction to the book. It's from 1804 Books, which we've done, I think, a couple, but at least one other. I know we did the, the Chavez speeches book with Manolo, but really appreciate the work that you all do as a as a press as well. A lot of work translating work from revolutionaries around the world and putting out uh, you know books like this one and so this is on the black belt thesis it's a black belt thesis reader it comprises a set of documents over a period of time that really talk about and examine the black belt thesis and we'll get into more of the nuts and bolts of that in a second but i'm just to start just to kind of ground us in what the book is you know i was interested in whether it was a syllabus for a study group it kind of 
could be used that way. Um, so, you know, say a little bit about the work of compiling this text, its purpose and utility to today, today, because I know at 1804 Books, you don't just put out the books for vibes, right? It's not a it's not a publishing house that just puts things out because they think they're cool or neat, but actually to be used by folks. So, yeah, just love if you just take a few minutes up front to talk about the process of putting this book together, where it came from and how it has been used or could be used. No, I really appreciate the question because, you know, it was an interesting process, a generative process. And and as if people pick up the book, you know, they'll see in the, the back towards the end and the acknowledgments, it came out of a Black Belt thesis study group, which in and of itself really came out of just sort of loose conversations. And you can see, you know, the names of some of the folks who were involved there in the back and, you know, different people who we were doing different work across various movements, anti-imperialist movements, working class stuff here in the U.S., And, you know, among many conversations we had, you know, one of those conversations that was a constant sort of red thread running through all of them is just the explicit importance of the Black liberation movement to revolutionary strategy, both in the past and, you know, in the present and likely in the future, and wanting to just delve a little bit more deeply into that and having participated in a few different schools and things where there had been, you know, short presentations, different pieces a couple folks in that mix said, well, why don't we just set up a study group and really start reading into, of course, the main documents of the Black Belt thesis, which people knew to some degree, the Common Turn Resolutions, Harry Haywood's Negro Liberation from 1948. But also let's like dig into the archives and do a little research in a way to find what some of the other texts you know, may or could be, and everyone sort of throwing in different ideas. Oh, this could be good. That could be good. And then a study group evolving out of that. So it is to some degree a syllabus, but it's also sort of a truncated syllabus in that sense, because it's sort of, you know, emerging from, let's say, if you read a whole book, what are the pieces of it that we can pull out, like from Allen, like from Padmore, like from Haywood. And so that was sort of how it sort of developed was the end product of having done the study group. Okay, let's do a book. And it's it's interesting in a way, I came into it in the introduction almost as like a discussant because of course I was very eager to be in the study group. And then of course, it's three times in, I got too busy and had to kind of drop out. So I was just like constantly asking folks, how's it going? What are we talking about? And at the end, it was, everyone was saying, we should try to do a book. We should try to come up with some selections. And I said, great. Like, I would love to, you know, do what I can in that process to, to help contribute or, you know, whatever it may be. And I gave some thoughts. And then of course, subsequently, came back around and they asked me to do the introduction, which I was very honored to do and wasn't really expecting. So that was also cool because it was a way for me to kind of reflect on where the conversations had gone when I wasn't there and what the previous conversations, how that had, you know, driven other people's thought process and research direction and how people came back around and saw it. And then it gave me a really rich tapestry to work with going back, looking at the particular selections and then doing even deeper research for myself to write that introduction, to really try to frame the whole thing. So that's a little bit of how it came together. And I think the main real purpose of doing it is, I think, twofold. I mean, one, just by, I think, promoting it to just continue to foreground the importance of Black liberation strategically, you know, in the United States. And I know we'll get into a lot of that. But then two, knowing that just there are a lot of people or, well, I don't know what, how we define a lot, but there's a good number of people who obviously, you know, feel the same way and are in struggle and are are fighting, you know, in the BLM, the real BLM, not the, the subsequent one, that are just looking for more accessible ways to get deeper into some of this past historical theory that, you know, there's a lot to it and it can be daunting, I think, to jump in. And so to also just provide a guide for people who are looking to dive in, maybe they've heard of Harry Haywood, they've heard of the Black Belt thesis, they've heard of the CP, you know, role in the 30s and the Black struggle and are thinking, how, where do I start? And that hopefully we hope that this can give people a little bit of an anchor as well in their studies. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. So can you give us a little bit of breakdown of the history of the Black Belt thesis? Where did it come from? What was this, its historical basis and what is your sense on why it was initially adopted by the common turn and the CPUSA? You know, it's a, it's an amazing history. It's a fascinating history. And, you know, it really sort of comes from, I think, two separate strains that were emerging at the same time. And you had, but they were connected in a way, but deeply tied, obviously, to the Russian Revolution, to the Bolshevik Revolution. And, and that, I think, is an important strain 
because Lenin for some time, and one of the pieces I actually lay out here in the introduction, he had felt, you know, going back to 1913, that Black people in America constituted a nation and should be considered amongst the other oppressed nations of the world, which were primarily just considered the European colonies at that time. But, you know, for a number of reasons, he felt that, you know, the the, the Black population in America felt that. And interestingly enough, a lot of his initial research on the question came from the 1910 census, where most of the, the material, or a good bit of the material, was compiled vis-a-vis Black Americans, was compiled by W.B. Du Bois. So an interesting sort of ships passing in the night there historically. But you had sort of emerging from the Bolshevik Revolution a feeling amongst the Bolsheviks in Russia that in the United States, people who called themselves and were revolutionaries, communists, socialists, did not actually put it... It's not even to say they didn't put enough focus on the Black struggle, but they didn't actually understand theoretically how it fit into the struggle against capitalism and that that was a big problem for them. And I think that was something they recognized very early on, but you know they can't force people to do anything in particular. All they can do is put out different commentary on this issue, and they certainly would push people on it. But the other strain that comes along that I think you know brings and culminates in the, the Black Belt thesis is the radicalized individuals coming out of the Black struggle in America in 1919 and 1924 who were looking to the worldwide communist movement as the most effective vehicle by which oppressed peoples and exploited peoples and, you know, where that Venn diagram crossed. When you look at something like the Black Nation, where almost everyone's a worker or at least, you know, deeply, deeply economically exploited, that, that this was the, you know, the, the agency by which they could move forward and advance their struggle. And they, too, were unhappy with the sort of practical day to day. I mean, not that there were not a lot of things going on and we could spend a lot of time if we wanted to talking about pre-1928 communist interactions with the Black struggle. But let's just go to the Black Belt thesis here that the sort of day to day struggle was not sufficient. There is a lot of anger and a lot of, you know, frustration over the fact that it seemed the Black struggle was put subsidiary to other struggles. There was still, you know, from their point of view, and I think from anyone's point of view, a, you know, unacceptable level of racism inside of the ranks of the communist movement. And even though many Black leaders were being elevated to high levels and were able to come up with many creative interventions in many different struggles, it just wasn't it. And so those two sort of feelings, I think, of frustration came together in an important way because Harry Haywood was in the Soviet Union in the late 1920s. And he was, I think many people considered one of the main kind of theoretical minds, at least amongst Black socialists. And he had become very interested at what many of the sort of Bolsheviks were were saying to him, like, what do you think about this? We think that there's a Black nation. What do you think? And he starts to do this intensive study of the Garvey movement, of all these other things. At the same time, there's more Black students coming to the Soviet Union for different forms of political training and education. And they're, you know, telling him, like, the situation back in the U.S. is, is not really great. And so those two kind of Phillips come together at a very particular moment, which is the 1928 Congress of the Comintern, which has a whole other, you know, long history behind it. But, you know, the important factor about it, I think, for this is it was a major turn for the international communist movement in terms of their attitude towards, you know, liberals, social democrats, and others because of certain internal situations in the Soviet Union, also the failure of things like the first Chinese revolution, and ultimately, long story short, it created a a reality in the Soviet Union whereby they felt that there was a coming economic collapse, that there was going to be the possibility of revolution breaking out in, you know, many different countries around the world, but that because liberal social democratic forces who claim to be progressive were basically against socialist solutions to the problems of the day, they were as big a problem as right-wingers. And so you had no choice really but to struggle against both the right wing, the fascist, which are, of course, rising at that time, and what they called the social fascists, the social democrats. And that's relevant to the Black Belt thesis because America was so racist that really no other position, no other theoretical position was going to put you in as adversarial of a political position as full-on support for Black people in America to have the right to self-determination up to and including separation in the Black Belt South, full equal rights in the North, like, you know, essentially nobody is for this. So it fit, I think, very neatly into 
the concerns that already existed in the international communist movement about why the American communist movement was not strong enough, the concerns coming from Black communists and I think white communists who agreed with them at the time that their work was inadequate in the Black community and the Black liberation struggle in and of itself, and the fact that you had this very particular historical moment that made the turn towards an aggressive crusade against white supremacy and racism fit very neatly into the broader agenda that was being put forward by the leadership of the international communist movement. And all of that comes together to create the space for the Black Belt thesis to emerge. Yeah, right on. So I wanted to read a little bit from your introduction, which is excellent. You begin your introduction by writing, the Black Belt thesis is foundational to Black national consciousness. The first universalized theory that Black people in the United States make up a nation within a nation. Even though its origins are in the communist movement, its insights are behind fundamental intellectual, cultural, and political pillars of the Black liberation movement. The Black Belt thesis solidified a particular communist contribution to the Black liberation movement, producing a unified understanding of the economic status, geographic distribution, and second-class citizenship of Black Americans. It named particular enemies, capitalists, and strategic allies, the working class, of the Black liberation movement. It prescribed the process, socialist revolution, by which Black people could gain the practical ability to alter their subaltern circumstances, preferential access to the means of production. Communists identified an example of similar handling of the national question in the Soviet Union, offering the USSR as a proof of concept in their strategies, even more so since the Soviets enthusiastically supported the black fight in the U.S., end quote. Goes on, and I could, you know, quote at more length, because again, I really do think this is a great introduction. But just flesh out those couple of paragraphs for us a bit. Um, you're touching on some really important points here. One, that the Black Belt thesis is a contribution of communist history within the United States. Black communist history in dialogue with Lenin and Comintern and the CPUSA as an organization. And I know we'll get into some of that a little bit more as we go on. But it's communist history nonetheless. And yet it is also a key pillar of Black nationalism, you know, particularly Black revolutionary nationalism, and represents some some clear objective conditions as well. So talk a little bit about all of that. No, you know, I, I think it's 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 an interesting and an important point to really key in on, really. And, and I, that's honestly one of the more interesting parts of my research was revisiting Harry Haywood's, you know, development of the thesis. But I think even of itself, the sort of afterlife of it, which I talk about a little bit as well, sort of the deep grounding that you find from what was put forward in this and many further revolutionary nationalist movements, even maybe the general understanding of Black people in America. I start the introduction with, uh, you know, it's nation time, and I call it an African-American proverb. But I mean, you know, it really is. And the fact that that sort of national consciousness existed was kind of the thing that sunk Haywood's teeth into the idea of this and why I think it's a particular communist contribution to maybe a generalized issue slash problem, however you want to look at it in that sense. Because, you know, Haywood, interestingly enough, when he first started studying it, was very skeptical of the idea. But he actually gets in, I mentioned this briefly, into a deep study of the Garvey movement. There was also at that time in the late 1920s, something called the 49th State Movement, which was another sort of similar sort of piece of trying to set up a a separate piece of land inside the United States, 49th state where people could live. Also worth noting, this is around the same time that the Moorish Science Temple is also emerging, which of course the Nation of Islam would emerge out of several years after that. But the basic point, and this is what he talks about in Black Bolshevik, is that it was obvious to him that even though it had been expressed in many different ways, there was a national consciousness that was obviously in existence and that there was a certain, and especially I think looking at the Garvey movement, there was this very potent element that you could pick up of why it took off so well and took off so you know majorly in the early 1920s of understanding that people were, were really expressing the sense of what national consciousness really means. I mean, one, what it means culturally against, you know, cultural degradation, which is, you know, one of the main features of white supremacy, but also what it meant in terms of, you know, the politics of a community wanting to be able to control its own destiny. And so he applied to that very particular materialistic framework. 
you know, what is it exactly? Why ultimately did we end up over here, right? Like, that's the first question. What were the processes by which one group of people felt the need to steal millions of people out of Africa, bring them to America, and set them to work as slaves? In the context of that, what is the role of that slavery in building up the broader American political economy? And in addition to that, what is then the process of both the abolition of slavery, the rise of Reconstruction, and the defeat of Reconstruction in that same process to establish what then was this sort of stable Jim Crow status quo, North and South, that you know I think most people could see at that point was playing some role in terms of the super exploitation of capitalism. So he was trying to look at what's the through line between the creation of capitalism in the United States of America in a very real sense the role that slavery and then subsequently the destruction of Reconstruction played in establishing monopoly capital as it moved on and developed over time, and why that then had set into amber, if you will, this permanent oppression of Black people. And so what comes out of that from his perspective and the perspective that's then taken on by many others and becomes the 1928 resolution is, you know, very much that this whole process took people from a range of different ethnicities, religions, parts of the continent, and melded them into one people. And this is, of course, a process that I think, you know, most people are familiar with in the history of of slavery, of, you know, taking people, everyone's speaking English, people are living in a compact area, you know, there's a general sort of economic reality to how you, you are allowed to make your livelihood or not, and that all of these things forged a unique identity for Black people in America that had deep African roots, but a very particularistic reality in the United States. States of America, too, especially because of the one drop rule and the history of slavery and the history of social control, and that there was this one brief moment where perhaps that could be broken up in reconstruction, but that ended up being inconvenient for the establishment of monopoly capital. So that was destroyed. And, you know, for reasons I think we can get into in some of the further questions, you know, that became absolutely critical for the maintenance of monopoly capital moving forward. So it it basically posited a very specific relationship, that there could be no capitalism in America from its foundation unless you had the Black nation. And in the specifics of capitalism, there could be no maintenance of monopoly capitalism without the maintenance of the national oppression of Black people. It was actually just too essential because of its deep role in the in the very earliest DNA of the establishment of capitalist political economy in America. And that flowing from that analysis, it created various different other analyses that come from that, that A, you know, capitalism is the enemy, that imperialism, which is, you know, just monopoly capitalism in another form, is ultimately the force that is behind the oppression of Black people, that that creates a certain subset of people whose enemies are also imperialism, and that that creates a certain basis for a potential unity inside of a communist political party as the vehicle by which one can achieve liberation by being able to address the main issue, which is not having any control over your daily life, which in capitalism means working people having no control over the means of production and capital. So that's a little bit of what I was getting at with that passage. Hopefully I wasn't too all over the place. No, that's great. I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, you also pull a quote from Harry Haywood, who obviously was a key figure in the development of the Black Belt thesis and has multiple writings that are gathered in his text. And the quote that we wanted to read was the analysis of the Black Belt thesis, which he says, destroys forever the white racist theory, which relegated like the struggle of Blacks to a subsidiary uh, position in the revolutionary movement. He goes on to say that the new line established that the Black freedom struggle is a revolutionary movement in its own right, directed against the very foundation of U.S. imperialism with its own dynamic pace and moment, and places the Black liberation movement and class struggle of the U.S., workers in the proper relationship as two aspects of the fight against the common enemy, U.S. capitalism, end quote. So this is a dynamic that is laid out in multiple forms throughout the book. Can you talk about that? Because some people obviously still argue that there are separate struggles or that we should focus on the working class struggle solely or the Black revolutionary national struggle. How did the communists in this book see this dynamic unfolding towards socialist revolution? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think it's one of the more interesting elements of how they tried to develop this is really the idea that the national struggle is a form of class struggle. And I think it's almost like an expansion of the term class struggle, which is something that I think to some degree is also something that Lenin had introduced I and mean, that the Comintern introduced in their sort of you know broader critique of 
you know, what they came to call the national colonial question and the importance of the anti-colonial uprisings and the idea of world revolution. And that is, you know, it's a it, class is constructed in real time. And that class is constructed across various different strata and hierarchies. And that national oppression has been used around the world, but certainly in the United States, fundamentally to cement a certain type of class structure. And that you can't really address the issue of certainly class unity. And that's one of the main things they were talking about without addressing the main issue of why there is disunity, which is white supremacy and racism which many workers are infected by in this issue of what the Russians would call great nation chauvinism, but that you also couldn't actually really talk about the reality for Black workers if you didn't take into account the various different sort of multiple ways, both exploitation as workers and oppression as part members of the Black nation interacted with each other to create, you know, for lack of a better term, the lived experience, you know, by which people engage with society, right? So you can't actually engage with people in a real way if you're unable to engage in the systems and structures that are structuring how they view themselves. And in that sense, national oppression is 100% integral to capitalism. And this is one of the points they were making, and that I think has proven to be true over time. This is partially why, you know, the, the struggle for Black liberation, even when it's oftentimes demanding what I would consider like very simple things, just like basic human rights, can immediately become a very radical struggle that starts to touch at the absolute core of the American system, which seems like it shouldn't be the case. I mean, like, just don't shoot us down in the street or kill us, you know, don't discriminate against us and things in which we are qualified. I mean, just basic things like that, you know, can lead to these great, large, huge struggles. And that a big piece of that is it's so integral to capital, the role of national oppression in the construction of the U.S. political economy. There's actually no way to talk about resolving the issues around all of the various racist disparities that exist, white supremacy as an institution in the United States, without actually talking about the foundations of capital. I mean, when you really think, like, why is it that Black people are, you know, basically, if you look at any terrible statistic, tend to be disproportionately the most affected, that's not just a matter of happenstance, that's a matter of systems and structures that are designed to create that. And so when you start to question that, that means the systems and structures that rely on that, you know, really start, the foundation starts to shake. So it gives the national revolutionary movement, the Black liberation movement, its own ability and its own motion in many ways, sometimes regardless of the exact shape of how the demands are, as long as it's this mass upsurge, the ability to in and of itself shake the foundations of capitalism in a very real way. But that since it's raising the question of capitalism and that Black people are a minority in the country, it's also raising the question very distinctly of how do you actually make it fall, not just shake the foundations. And that means that you have to engage other people who have the same enemy. So it's really sort of a synthetic sort of way of looking at the struggle that, you know, recognizes in a way the sort of like class on class workers versus bosses class struggle and the national struggle of black people can have their sort of own motion to a degree that ultimately, since they're aimed at the same enemy, the motion is interconnected. And that in any particular moment, it may not be, you know, exactly working on the same page. You know, you might not have the uprising against racism at the same time you have the UAW strike. But at the end of the day, if the sort of labor struggle in its very particular form and the Black revolutionary struggle in its very particular form don't find a way, you know, to create that sort of synthetic motion, it'll be very easy for the imperialists to play the same strategy they always have been able to do by dividing people based on strategy, based on hierarchy, in a way that allows them to break up the actual unity that in a tactical, strategical sense can actually undermine the foundations of what they're doing. So it's an attempt to try to create kind of a, a complex analysis that maybe has a certain je ne sais quoi to it as much as it is scientific, but that really is trying to hold out the idea and the belief that ultimately, without preconditions, the nature of the construction of capitalist political economy gives the Black liberation movement revolutionary potentiality. And in many ways, historically, the chief sort of detonator, instigator effect to all radical motion in the U.S. typically, but that in and of itself, it speaks to the class enemy, it speaks to the imperialist ruling class, and thus it speaks to the, sort of the broader struggle against imperialism, which means making the national struggle, the national colonial struggle, as they would have called it at that time, and the working class struggle really work in one stream. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to touch a little bit on a couple of the common turn resolutions, because even though 
I think in some circles, those are probably known. I, you know, I think that probably a lot of folks really aren't that familiar with them beyond the fact of maybe knowing that they existed, right? And so, so the original 1928 Common Turn Resolution is, you know, quite a thorough document. It deals with theoretical implications, practical implications, talks about, you know, white chauvinism within the party, which is a, you know, kind of a key thread also that moves through a lot of the reflections throughout this book, which you've already talked about. I mean, this is the the problem, right, of, you know, kind of a white labor first, you know, racism within the unions, you know, thinking that you can have a class struggle without this dealing with this essential question, you know, and then it, it also has directives within the resolution for, you know, types of work to make Black liberation a reality, not just in the U.S., but also, you know, globally, you know, there's a connection to Africa here. It is illustrated in some of the essays in this book. But can you say a little bit about parts of this work that were maybe more difficult than anticipated? Or do you think it was really the shift to the popular front and subsequent McCarthyism that made this work so difficult for the CBUSA? I guess what I'm saying here is obviously we know ultimately that the Communist Party, you know, did work in this perspective. There's great books people can read about it. I mean, Hammer and Ho is like a really great history here. But I'm interested also in thinking about, I know in this book, you're looking at this over time as well. And obviously the party shifts and there are geopolitical reasons for this, strategic reasons for this, and also internal contradictions in the United States with regard to, you know, McCarthyism, post-World War II, et cetera. But I'm interested in kind of how you think about the sort of effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the CPUS during the period where they were really seeking to implement this. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I would say, and I and I, I think the popular front point is an interesting point and, and one I'll come back to. I mean, I would say in the initial period, the impact of the thesis was huge on their work. And I think in general, made a huge difference. I mean, and just to take one step back, part of the critique that was being made that brought the thesis to the forefront was this idea that the lack of activity, or maybe not lack of activity, but the lack of real purchase hold in the Black liberation movement and the communist movement wasn't just like lack of trying hard. It wasn't a lack of talented, you know, Black cadres. There wasn't a lot of them, but there were many talented people. It wasn't any of that. It was the lack of a theoretical framework that made the Black liberation movement seem central to the revolutionary process of America, which then would then infuse all of the other work with this idea that if you don't raise at a high level, you know, at on every single struggle, actually, and we're, you know, talking about late 20s, 1930s, so really in every single struggle, the critical importance of Black liberation and the fact that white supremacy can have no place, you can't succeed. So a lot of the work that communists did I think was actually quite significant. I mean, it's interesting. I was reading something about, in the, there's a book by Roger Kiernan called The Communist Party and the Auto Workers Union. And in the early 1930s, when, you know, the communists were one of the leading forces and in the auto workers union, and when, of course, they were also trying to bring into fruition this new line that had flowed from the 1928 and the 1930 thesis, the updated the 1928 thesis that happened in 1930, one of the critiques that was used against them by anti-communist was that, if I can get the phrase right here, that they too often bent over backwards to, you know, be anti-racist as we would frame it today. So essentially one of the number one cudgels that was used against them is that they were doing too much to address racism. Now, of course, I don't think you can ever do too much, but in that time, in that context, it was actually effective in, you know, getting some workers to believe that, you know, communists were bad. It's also interesting if you look and examine the National Miners Union strike, which is a huge strike that happened in 1930, Western Pennsylvania, Kentucky. That's actually when the sort of bloody Harlan, if you've heard of Harlan County, was happening. But it was also, you know, a significant thing in Western Pennsylvania, definitely West Virginia. But I say all that just to say that the nature of the strike was very interesting because the reason why all of the the coal companies felt they could go on offensive all at once is they thought, well, there's no way that black and white miners would actually get together. And so the communists who were leading the strike, because at that time, you know, the United Mine Workers did not want to lead any strikes, they actually sent almost all of their black cadre into the coal fields. They made it one of the number one objectives. They actually, the guy who becomes the president of the National Miners Union is a, a black Minor, and I was reading in the the archives of the Pittsburgh Courier, which was, of course, 
you know, one of the most conservative black newspapers. So certainly one that was like the most predisposed to not be for communists. And they were noting that this was so shocking that they would be leading the strike in this way and have a black person leading a union that it showed that they were really serious about what they were talking about. And they considered there to only be four main political parties at that point, the Pittsburgh Courier, the communists, the socialists, the Republicans, the Democrats, which gives you just a sense of that purchase hold. And there was the Yokinen trial in 1929, which people may have known where they tried a guy, a Finnish guy for racism in the party in front of thousands of people in Harlem in a public trial. And so I think in terms of the practical work they took on in the early period after the thesis, even though there was a lot of give and take, and it's honestly fascinating to read the party organizer, which was their internal organ, you know, around this time about this issue, because it's talking about, you know, how they're struggling to change the line. But when you look at the sort of end result of the work, I think it really truly was a reorientation of putting it right at the, putting this right at the center of so many different pieces. And a lot of the subsequent things that would happen to use the auto workers example, again, the fact that when the UAW is formed later in the thirties under the CIO, the issue of uniting across, you know, many different lines, but certainly racial lines is actually there in the context of what's happening are these struggles that happened in the early 30s. But I say that to say that I think that the various vacillations of the communist movement over this time period, I think had a negative impact on basically all forms of strategy and theory. I mean, they have their own realities. And I think sometimes they're, you know, many times I might argue, so poorly misunderstood as like these just like totally crazy zigzags being thrown in from Moscow when, you know, they were real responses to real geopolitical things that were going on. But oftentimes they weren't necessarily responses that were rooted 100 percent in the American reality of how these events were affecting things, but sort of flowing from how they were affecting the Soviet Union. And that sort of flow, you know, also creating a space whereby communists around the world you know, were also changing their positions to sort of fit into that kind of framework. So I think it meant that there was never enough of like an organic development of what it would really mean to develop this line in the American context. And there was a lot of good work that was done. But you think like in 1927, W.B. Du Bois speaks at a meeting of the American Negro Labor Congress about Haiti against the occupation on Haiti. And then like a year later, they're calling him the worst of the worst, you know, social fascist, you know, could, you know, as bad as anyone you could ever imagine, as bad as the racist, a washed up leader, everything you could think of. And then again, by the middle 30s, they're working with him again. And, you know, of course, Du Bois had his vicissitudes as well at this time. But you have to think like, OK, there's no way that there is no possibility to find a more balanced perception of what role certain elements within the NAACP, like Du Bois and the NAACP itself, were playing in the broader struggle. And what any of the end result of any of this would have been, I can't say exactly, but I do think, you know, you have these kind of quick swings back and forth, which meant that you never really had a fully kind of grounded ability to sort of say, okay, now that we have this general understanding, how does it play out? What are the different class forces? There were always different elements that I think, you know, prevented or bent the tree maybe too much in one way or another, and I think prevented a full flowering explication of what it could look like. And I think this is some of the work that Harry Haywood was trying to do when he put out Negro Liberation in 1948. The revolutionary position on the Negro question in 1956 was to try to develop a little bit more deeply, you know, specifically from this context, what that was going to be. But then, of course, the Cold War, you know, intervenes and creates its own realities. Yeah, that's I appreciate that. And I know we'll get into some of those some of the kind of black left infighting in one of the questions a little bit later on too. There's some interesting stuff. And then also I think some good some good critiques too, but it, you know, it's it's an interesting thing that way. So I want to read a little bit. There's a subsequent 1930 common turn resolution, which sought to address some of the concerns that came up with the 1928 resolution from within the CPUSA. So I'm just going to read a brief section of that. Apologies to the listeners, I'm going to use the language that is in the text, which is definitely dated, but this is the, you know, was the proper terminology at the at the time in 1930, right? So, but I wanted to read it really, because I think it like, analytically, and, you know, it's just a very sound and well constructed document. So, quote, it is only a Yankee bourgeois lie to say that the yoke of Negro slavery has been lifted in the United States. Formally, it has been abolished. 
But in practice, the great majority of Negro masses in the South are living in slavery in the literal sense of the word. Formerly, they are, quote unquote, free or, quote unquote, tenant farmers or, quote unquote, contract laborers on a big plantation of the white landowners. But actually, they are completely in the power of their exploiters. They are not permitted or else it is made impossible for them to leave their exploiters. If they do leave the plantations, they are brought back and in many cases whipped. Many of them are simply taken prisoner under various pretexts and bound together with long chains. They have to do compulsory labor on the roads. All through the South, the Negroes are not only deprived of their rights and are subjected to arbitrary will of white exploiters, but they are also socially ostracized. That is, they are treated in general not as human beings, but as cattle. But this ostracism regarding the Negroes is not limited to the South, not only in the South, but throughout the United States. The lynching of Negroes is permitted to go unpunished. Everywhere, the American bourgeoisie surrounds the Negroes with an atmosphere of social ostracism, end quote. Obviously, it goes on and on. I just wanted to read a little bit of that because I, you know, like many passages in this book, I found it to be a very strong, you know, strongly well articulated passage. It's direct, it's clear, accurate in analysis in ways that you would not find in, you know, American bourgeois literature or history. We'll get to a question on that later. But I think like throughout this book, there's historical analysis that is way ahead of its time. And a lot of times, you know, more accurate, I think, than stuff that's produced today. So anyways, just say a little bit more about some of the issues the second resolution sought to address and a bit about how it developed the line of the Communist Party in this period. In particular, a few things I found really interesting were the response to the question of the Black Belt constituting a colony, which is one of the, you know, is an interesting thing. It's something that's still discussed, right? In part because it rejects the thesis of it being a colony, but still upholds the idea that Black people constitute an oppressed nation. Another was the question of land confiscation, agrarian revolution, and the right of self-determination. And, you know, it's the absolute right to self-determination, even if that meant that Black people didn't end up following a communist line or that self-determination didn't express itself in a form that the communists wanted, which I think is a really important point, too. So, yeah, talk a little bit about this section and any other clarifications you think are important within that resolution. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you asked that because, you know, when you think about the 28 and the 1930 resolution, they're both very of the moment. And it's, I think, looking at the 1930 resolution almost as like, how is it going two years on and what have we found in terms of the misinterpretation? And and that was one of the more interesting things for me, actually, was digging into the party organizer, digging into the archives of the Daily Worker when I was thinking about the introduction is really seeing that. But it helped me kind of see the 1930 resolution with new eyes because you can see they're addressing a lot of the things that they're actually struggling with in the course of implementing the line. And I think the point you make about the colony really does stand out. And I'm glad you grabbed onto that because, you know, it really does speak to the passage you laid forward in this idea of the shadow of the plantation, right? That even in the North, and that's one of the more interesting aspects of national oppression is that in of black people in America is that it you know the black nation was obviously formed in the black belt south and certainly that's what the thesis is laying out and it still represents a national homeland and the you know largest population of black people but that it also has this sort of non geographic element to it that no matter where black people go they're still subject to some sort of shadow form of the jim crow plantation style oppression that exists like one of the things that was most interesting to me reading the daily worker around this 1930 time a couple of you know the years intervening were how many like lynching and frame up type cases were coming up in new jersey I was just like, wow, that, you know, is something that you wouldn't normally think of, but obviously it was a big factor in their work there. And I think that element of, you know, this piece was speaking to, it was speaking to a couple different things. I mean, I think it was, it's speaking to one kind of an overhang of the past previous line of other leaders in the 1920s who felt that Blacks in the South were, you know, somewhat like a colony and also, you know, really kind of a, they called them at that time actually a bastion of reaction because, you know, they said that they really just followed the leadership of the plantation owners. That, of course, was destroyed in 1928. But I think there was still some overhang that there is this stark separation between Black workers in the North and Black workers in the South, and that it could, in fact, be 
you know, legitimate, and there was a guy named Claude Pepper, it's a whole other thing, who actually raised this line, that it would be legitimate to have a Black Negro Soviet Republic, he called it, in the South, but that in the North, there was like no special demands. The struggle against racism was not, you know, something that should necessarily be put in the forefront. Blacks were workers like everyone else. You know, there shouldn't be a carryover there. So it's an attempt, I think, to clarify in this, like, no, that is in fact false, um, that, you know, the issue of foregrounding self-determination and Black liberation applies everywhere and at all times because of this shadow plantation reality. And that, and I think it says in the resolution, they're not trying to make a hard and fast distinction really between like, is it a colony? Is it not a colony? But to suggest that there is enough non-identification that we actually have to pitch the struggle in a slightly different way. And it can't be looked at in the same way we look at, you know, a similar situation vis-a-vis say India and the, you know, the United Kingdom in that context. But really, I think trying to foreground and push back against those who were trying to manipulate the thesis to basically say in the North, we don't have to really aggressively work around racism and to expand that by challenging what they were sort of saying, which is, 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 you know, it is a colony. And to really sort of note that it notes that this kind of you know, the fact that it's not re- fully a colony, but the Black nation isn't fully really integrated into the broader space, like that kind of almost difficult to grasp reality of the question is one of the things we have to grapple with. But that's why it's so important to apply, you know, this all, you know, across the whole country, the importance of the Black liberation struggle of having this detonator effect strategically, politically, which, you know, I think does then speak to the the second part of of what you were, I think, asking in regards to uh, mm, self determination. I mean, like how how like no preconditions, which is another piece of it. And I think you know that is a long history in the sort of what people call the Leninist or Bolshevik conception of the national question, quote unquote, is how can you actually be for national liberation? if you start putting conditions on oppressed people. Well, I'm for your liberation if you do X. Well, then you're not really for it. And so that one of the most important factors that you know they're trying to distinguish in 1930 and that Lenin was always trying to distinguish is communists, especially from oppressed nations, certainly can have their own position on what they think the best course of the struggle is and how that struggle should go. But the Communist Party as an entity has to commit itself to being in favor of national liberation, you know, up to and including the right of separation on the terms that the nationally oppressed set for themselves, or else they're not really for real. And if you actually want to build unity across a multinational space to build an entity that can take on the imperialist ruling class, well, there's no way you can really do that by just telling people you're for their struggle. You have to be for their struggle, root, branch, heart and soul, even if you don't 100% agree you know, with the actual resolution. It's, it's part of showing that really, ultimately, it's not about positioning, it's not about maneuvering, it's not about politics, but it's about a real belief that self-determination and national liberation is required in order to you know, move forward the struggle towards socialism. Now, of course, it then goes on to note that, you know, as they were already doing, that the Communist Party and Black communists, you know, did not have to advocate for, say, secession or anything like that. But you're advocating for the right of self-determination, for the right of the press people to decide for themselves. And as Lenin would always say, that's not really a practical question. So it's not about whether it makes sense, whether it doesn't make sense, whether this, whether that. It's a question of whether it's just and whether it's right. And if it's just and it's right, that's why we support it. So we support the right to self-determination, no matter how practical or impractical it may seem. But that was, of course, one of the things that people were constantly trying to hold against it was, well, this seems impractical to have you know, this happened. But I think, you know, some of the things, and one I'll close on this one and this one that I think are interesting about that resolution that kind of speak to it is also the demand, right, for the Black Belt not to be broken up through multiple different jurisdictions, like states and counties and things like that, which I think in and of itself has an interesting conversation about, you know, the political structure of the United States and America and how anti-democratic it is in and of itself. And I think introducing this idea of having like, you know, the compact Black Belt region you know, be its own space with no, you know, state or county lines or whatever that are determined by outside forces, I think also speaks very heavily, you know, to the same concept that the Black liberation movement can start to raise issues that speak more deeply to the repressive and exploitive structure of the country, you know, including the political superstructure, not just the economic reality of it. But by and large, I look at that 1930 resolution basically as an update to some degree that's trying to address 
the sort of overhangs of people who were, I think, you know, kind of looking, because you couldn't really be against the thesis once it had come out from the common turn. So you have all these kind of like rear guard actions. But I think it led to important clarifications, especially about the relationship between the South and the North um, and, you know, the phenomenon that I think Malcolm X laid out the best. Uh, when you're south of the Canadian border, you're already south. Some of our Canadian friends would say they're the South too, but... <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so so this book features a couple of selections from George Padmore. One is a piece called Life Among Negro Farmers in America, and the other is a set of selections from his book, The Life and Struggles of the Negro Toilers, which I highly recommend. Incredible text. But yeah, in, in the latter, he polemicized against a set of Black leaders from this period, Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, Marcus Garvey, these are these figures that obviously have their own significant contributions to what we think of as the Black left today, I mean, indeed, in their own day as well. So obviously, we have to ground these comments in the, the in the time at which Padmore made them to probably understand where he was coming from. So this is on politics shifted over time, as did the people he was critiquing. But there were also other passages from the book that could have been in, included in, in this book instead of those passages. So I'm interested in what you think about the veracity and, and the political importance of these critiques of those figures. And if you think those critiques help us better understand the CPUSA position at the time as well as the Black Belt thesis. No, it's a great question. And I think it definitely helps us understand where they were at the time, because it's like pretty sharp. And if you don't know the history, I think it can kind of catch you off guard. It's like, whoa, because I think now, especially, you know, most people who consider themselves, you know, I on the more radical side of the Black liberation movement, I think generally do see at least some contributions from all those forces and try to bring those out in a big way. But I think understanding that time and that moment of that, what was called the third period, is actually very interesting to understanding, you know, sort of the pros and cons, right, of of how we look at this issue of the relationship between the individual country communist movements and the international communist movement. Because, you know, on the one hand, if it wouldn't have been for them drawing this aggressively sharp line against everyone who is basically not a communist, they never would have come up with the Black Belt thesis and they never would have essentially, you know, forced the party to take on the struggle against white supremacy, racism and the Jim Crow South as like a number one task, which I think obviously led to many positive things down the line and at the moment. So that never would have happened. But then the flip side of that then becomes, you know, the and I was speaking to this earlier, the inability, I think, to really fully ground the line in the conditions of you know, it, it, there's no purely national condition, so I hate to even say that, but let's just say like the the U.S. reflection of how these broader geopolitical currents were shaping communism internationally and international revolutionary movements in general, you know, it never really happened. And you think about all these individuals. I mean, you know, at one point, the communists and Garvey were working together. At one point, the communists and NAACP were working together. At one point, they were working together with A. Philip Randolph, like all in the 10 years before this. So, it, I mean, you know, you never really know if you're able to really build 100% unity. I mean, I think obviously in the Garvey movement, there were some particularities there with the, you know, the so-called Negro Sanhedrin in the mid-1920s, similar thing. Uh, that was actually, anyway, I won't get into that. But anyway, long story short, you know, you can see that there were the positive elements that opened up space, I think, towards mass struggle. But then I think some of the more negative elements that closed down space for where even limited united fronts could have been more useful and where the experience of past united fronts with some of the same people, I think, was lost. Now, that being said, some of the people on the other side were equally as intransigent. So in some ways, you know, when you start to look at these debates in the late 1920s between A. Philip Randolph, W.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, the communists, I mean, they're so bitter on all sides. You, I think certainly there's probably enough blame to go around. But to speak specifically, I think, to, to this this piece. And I think this piece was probably included a little bit more just because of Padmore's sort of grounding in the international context of where, you know, the Black working class and, and, you know, rural workers were. But I do think it's an important sort of window. And I think also a challenge in a way moving forward of looking and evaluating this history of like looking at all these various different trends, which I think it's pretty easy to say all made their contributions, but were in many ways at odds. What can we pick out of that now, you know, whatever, how many years later, almost 100 years later, around how we can build united fronts inside of the Black liberation movement that are not opportunistic, that aren't sellout based, but that also are recognizing that there is a certain, you know, in any national liberation struggle, there's got to be a certain 
you know, unity and diversity of various forces who have the same enemy. And I think that in a way is how I take this also is not even just a window into the history, but like, how does it challenge us to interpret that history to our work today? And I think those are maybe some of the questions I hope come up for people when they read the text. Yeah, right on. And I mean, we should say it was difficult to to do questions in some ways for this discussion because there's so many good pieces and we could easily like delve into any one of them and ask, you know, multiple questions just about that. So we wanted to give folks a flavor of kind of the variety of, you know, stuff and arguments that are in here, you know, and, and so now, you know, we we just had Padmore, right? And, you know, he's going at Du Bois and Garvey, right? And so then, then we follow that up with the 1953 essay that is included in this book that's from Du Bois. And there's a couple of passages from Du Bois in this book, but he writes, the organized effort of American industry to usurp government surpasses anything in modern history, even that of Adolf Hitler, from whom it was learned, to the use of organized gathering of news to guide opinion and then deliberately mislead it by scientific advertising and propaganda. This has led in our day to suppression of truth, omission of facts, misinterpretation of news and deliberate falsehood on a wide scale. Mass capitalistic control of books and periodicals, news gathering and distribution, radio, cinema, and television has made the throttling of democracy possible and the distortion of education and failures of justice widespread. End quote. So first of all, like we're recording this on October 11th. We're literally in the middle of a of a full scale information war that's going on from the Western institutions against Palestinians as they're being bombarded, as you know, they've courageously undertaken the latest aspect of a of a liberation struggle, you know, and all solidarity, obviously, from this outlet, and I know yours as well, with the Palestinian people in their struggle. I think that it's amazingly pertinent to read something like this written in 1953. I mean, a lot of I was talking to my father this week. And, you know, I think it's very easy for us to get nostalgic or rose colored glasses about a time when media in this country was like, unbiased or neutral or whatever. And here he is like outlining something that could very easily have been written this week, right. And people talk about misinformation and disinformation all the time. And a lot of times that's actually used against outlets like yours and ours to try to debunk us, our work of trying to sift through all the propaganda that, you know, masquerades as as news and media in this country. So just wanted to say that a little bit in terms of the context of this. But, you know, he also talks about how the black belt is, in essence, a construction of the capitalist ruling class in this section and other things, too. And I, and I just, you know, this is kind of a broader question and maybe we'll get into this a little bit more also, but like there's a lot of really great just political economic analysis from people in this text, Du Bois, Haywood, with regards to the black belt, like they don't just see the existence of a black belt as some like historical relic of slavery that is maintained merely because white people hate black people in some abstract sense or like discrimination and bigotry. You know, not that those things, obviously, they, of course, exist without question, but they see it as an intentionally constructed and politically reinforced condition for black folks in America that has a direct purpose for the overall capitalist system and political system. So I realize that question is kind of touching on two very different things. But, you know, those are just some reflections I had in particular looking at that piece from Du Bois and Haywood's work there as well. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, it is it is amazing, honestly, all this work that was produced. And I guess it's it's always kind of a mediation, I guess, on, you know, the quote unquote academy and, you know, what is sort of put out there as quote unquote theory and what are the things that are engaged with, what are the things that are not engaged with and how those different pieces happen. And I think, you know, I certainly think this is a window into into some of you know, the best thought of this period that unfortunately, you know, is never really considered in that way and is often just considered political rhetoric and propaganda. And, you know, maybe Du Bois a little less so because he's so well known, but certainly Harry Haywood and a lot of the richness gets lost because, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, th even thinking about the passage that you're laying out and it's sort of meaning in our current moment and how prescient it is. I, I mean, I think Du Bois is hitting on so much. I mean, I, you know, the one thing he's really hitting on directly, and of course, he's writing at the height of the high Cold War, 1953, which, you know, again, we're in the midst of 
as we're recording this information warfare against Palestinians and this attempt to have this new Cold War right now. So such a similar period in that time of just total, you know, to borrow a phrase from Trump, I guess, just complete and total fake news everywhere all the time and an unbelievable distortion of narratives. I mean, you know, Du Bois has tried in 1951 or almost tried uh, in 1951 for being a registered foreign agent of Russia. So, I mean, you know, there you go. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But definitely sort of thinking about the connection between those two periods is interesting in its own right. But I think another thing that he's pointing out coming out of World War II that I think is also interesting and to make maybe a uh, multiple connections here, skip the rock a couple of times. And this is, you know, one of the biggest taboos that's out there. But, you know, how exceptional was Hitler? I mean, obviously, he was exceptionally terrible in every possible way, in a moral sense. But I think what Du Bois is also kind of drawing to here is that in many ways, he was perfecting a lot of different elements that were perhaps relatively general to capitalist modernity in different ways. Now, of course, it didn't always express itself in that brutal of a fashion, but it did more often than not in terms of popular perception, at least. You know, obviously, colonialism, where there was constant, you know, genocides of people, murders, and we don't have to go into that. People can look in the history and find it. The reality of the Jim Crow South and lynching here in the United States of America. And it does remind me to some degree of George Jackson's analysis on the same issue and someone else who does not, you know, get taken seriously as a theorist and his general, you know, point about fascism. And I think there's interesting pieces to this that I would both, you know, agree with and dispute, but I think it's an interesting and related point that, you know, there's a lot of elements that we consider to be quote unquote fascist in a sort of exceptional German sense are things that can be found present in sort of modern industrial society period. And that I think that was an extraordinarily prescient thing that he offered for us, which is that our analysis of fascism, even in our current moment, is very much rooted, and I think this is partially what Du Bois is saying, you know, it's very much rooted in two very specific examples, Germany and Italy, in a very discreet amount of time. But it doesn't really grapple with the fact that, you know, Hitler was borrowing from the United States very openly and very much admired, you know, much of the so-called you know, racial classification system here in the United States. It doesn't talk to and touch on many of the things that Du Bois was laying about how modern technologies could be used and manipulated by powerful forces. Certainly the role of corporatism, which is certainly the piece that I think George Jackson Church touched on a lot, which we can see with the rise of the military industrial complex after World War II, which in and of itself was a, a form of corporatism, I would say. So I think it also gives us sort of an interesting thing to sink our teeth into because it is so prescient about how we analyze fascism in the present day and, you know, what our historical antecedents should be and what do we consider fascist that is really actually maybe just par for the course for sort of modern imperialist industrial society, which doesn't make it right or less outrageous or anything like that, which I think is how sometimes people are talking about fascism because they want to give it the correct register of, of outrage about these terrible abuses. But, you know, how much of that should we consider exceptional? Like, oh, this is fascism versus regular capitalist democracy. And how much of it should we consider to be actually sort of baked into the system in, in terms of its post-World War II, maybe let's say post-Depression era realities? And I think Du Bois kind of raising that question also gives us an entree to think more about George Jackson and then gives us an entree to think about where we are today when this is, you know, basically the number one thing that's being put out there that since Trump is a fascist, you know, liberals and social Democrats are saying all political strategy has to revolve around that and that there isn't really much of a space for a revolutionary critique in our current society because it has to be all against the right and all against fascism. So a lot to think about and dig into there, but that's something that jumped out at me from that passage. Yeah, absolutely. So a great quote I wanted to pull from Louise Patterson Thompson's piece, and I'm quoting here, it is impossible to take one step in the direction of winning of the Negro people their elementary rights. That is not revolutionary. Capitalism developed in America upon the super exploitation of the Negro people and through the division it created between white and Negro labor. Any attempt to end the super exploitation to destroy the anonymity and to unite Negro and white labor is a blow at American capitalism. So it is in Southern ruling class is not going to budge from its position of exploiting and oppressing the Negro people. And behind the Southern bourbons stand the amassed strength of American finance capital, U.S. steel, Wall Street, investments in the plantations of the South and the like, and organizations among the Negro people, which do not point out these class alignments there must therefore become the voice of reaction in the midst of a people struggling for freedom. So it is that the leadership among the Negro people must 
pass into new hands, into the hands of working class leaders, to D'Angelo Hernandez, uh, who, who will not be stopped by jail, by desire to cling on to jobs, by death itself and leading the Negro people through the final co- conflict to complete emancipation, end quote. So it's just notable reading this book that there are very strong critiques of the Black bourgeoisie throughout the book. And this is getting to the question others in the book address as well, a bit more directly. But I want to include this quote because it is also very clear on the class alignments and interests at play. And so it is noteworthy because you know there could be an argument that a focus on the Black liberation movement should lead to a line of national unity for Black people that would include the incorporation of bourgeois and petty bourgeois forces. And obviously that did happen to some extent throughout the civil rights struggle, and I imagine within the communist supporters of it as well. But nonetheless, there is a lot of really principal criticism and analysis here. So what what where were the aspects of this that stood out to you and that you think are particularly politically important? Yeah, you know, I think it's a interesting. I mean, it's maybe one of the main questions of sort of, you know, revolutionary strategy in the, you know, quote unquote, first world that, you know, we're addressing. But I mean, also, of course, around the global south. But, you know, the relationship of the working class, to the petty bourgeoisie in the global south is maybe between peasants and workers. So it's different here. It's like sort of working class people in you know, upper strata of the working class that we call the middle class and then the actual petty bourgeoisie that have sort of a similar sort of piece. And yeah, I think it's an interesting critique because I think it points to sort of what's true. It points to a key true fact is like leadership is all important. That really at the end of the day, even if you have sort of a cross-class national liberation movement, if it doesn't have sort of a revolutionary working people-based leadership that has a broader horizon, that understands the intimate connection between national oppression and the actual existence of capitalist imperialism, then you're never going to be able to find the right answers. And that's why, in a way, it's an interesting passage because the way it starts, you know, it's, I think, a slight overestimation of the ability of capital and the ruling class to pivot. Because you can take some steps towards Negro liberation without it maybe having the most revolutionary aspects, but only small steps. And I think what we saw, especially in the civil rights movement, kind of speaks to that in a way, is that you were able to have, you know, a number of major upsurges of Black people for their basic, you know, civil and political rights in this country that opened up a broader period of radicalization in society, but that also then created within the ruling class in and of itself an imperative to try to integrate a larger number of sort of Black elites into, you know, the system in and of itself. So that, and I think we've seen since then, you know, the try to attempt to have a development of a quote unquote civil rights movement that is more or less if not totally divorced from class, not putting an understanding of capitalism at the center of its analysis of Black oppression, even if it does speak to the need, you know, for, you know, more assistance and so on and so forth. So I think what this really draws me to is the contradictions between, you know, what the petty bourgeoisie, the national bourgeoisie, and the comprador bourgeoisie. And those are all, you know, sort of, you know, old style Marxist terms, but it basically comes down to the fact that there is still, I think, in the idea of national liberation, since even, you know, as Miles Davis writes about in his autobiography, is one of his biggest things is getting pulled over, driving while black, while driving his Ferrari in New York City. You know what I mean? Like even rich and powerful people can be subject to many things. I forget the guy's name, but there's the guy, the black business guy who's always like suing McDonald's and these Comcast and these other people for, you know, not allowing him to advertise and these different things like that. So there's certainly an element of unity that exists. But we have to be able to develop that in a principled way, which means understanding the particular positioning of certain people. I think the vast majority of like the black bourgeoisie, if you will, is basically a comprador bourgeoisie. Like when you look at the black enterprise 100s list, you know, it's mainly people who are owning car dealerships, people with, you know, Budweiser and Coca-Cola franchises. Like, I mean, there are some bona fide companies, but they're not that many of them. You know, most of them are really just an adjunct of other people. And the same with the sort of elements of the petty bourgeoisie that are sort of allied to these forces is, you know, they're, you know, representing essentially the black faces in the majority white corporate firms that have been given a certain positioning to create the illusion of diversity, as it were. And I think that is the sort of dominant black political class that exists and acts, or the backing behind the dominant black political class that exists and acts in favor of the imperialist bourgeoisie, and to put in the worst kinds of neoliberal policies in the Black community. But I still think in that context, a you know real 
I would say, working class led. And I think this is what Louise Thompson Patterson is speaking to. Leadership would still probably draw into it in any you know, major struggle against racism and white supremacy, people who consider who are middle class, quote unquote, which are the upper strata of the working class, but people who are perhaps more traditionally in the petty bourgeoisie and things like that. So I think it's about making these really kind of fine grain, fine level distinctions in some ways about how we build those coalitions. But I also think just also speaking to the complications of how that takes place and whether it succeeds or fails is really heavily based on where the movement is rooted to begin with. Who is the leadership rooted in and who are they accountable to and what sort of interest are they expressing in carrying out this struggle from the beginning? Yeah, right on. So, you know, very central to this book and to the Black Belt thesis is the question of land. And I think that's, you know, just very clear when you read through this. So can you talk a little bit about that aspect in particular of the thesis and the centrality of land in the question of both socialist revolution and the Black liberation movement, which is something that that centrality to both of those things comes out in these articulations? Yeah, you know, the land question, which is, you know, in many ways, you, over the years become kind of the nettle of this question of the various debates. Like if you look at the debates in the 1970s around whether or not communists should take up the Black Belt thesis, the issue of land, you know, is very central. But, you know, it takes such a central role because the whole, the precondition essentially for the, A, let's say lack of success of Reconstruction, and then I think B, its staying power in terms of its ability to ultimately be defeated is rooted in the lack of any real land reform for Blacks in the South. The fact that they were moved from slavery essentially into a form of kind of semi-slavery rule agricultural worker, but essentially 100% reliant on the planter in a very similar way. I mean, they were formally free And, you know, I think Du Bois talks about this in Black Reconstruction. You can't count that out. Being formally free in and of itself has a huge psychological and dividend that it pays to you. So it's not that that's minor. But that being said, the lack of ability to have control of, you know, in a way, since we're talking about kind of the peasantry here, one's own means of production of land, of tools, and your own labor, your ability to build up a community on the basis of all the various industries and things like that that can be established in the context of growing agricultural, small hold farmer communities. It basically meant that the sharecropper reality of being tied to the land was then immediately brought back and the inability to really have that leverage point to use as a form of political and economic power to solidify Black rule in the South was, you know, ultimately one of the major downfalls of Reconstruction is that you didn't have the base to fall back on to really be able to defend the, you didn't have the economic base to defend the political gains, for lack of a better of a better phrase. And I think, you know, even today, when we think about the issue of land, it's an interesting reality. I mean, obviously, most people do not live in rural areas, period. Now, most of the most rural Black Belt counties, very, very few people live there. But it kind of speaks to the exact same thing, because it actually shows that the development of agribusiness in America, which in general is destroying small farming, also has disproportionately played a role in hollowing out many rural Black areas, sending people into you know mainly Southern Black cities to create an even larger army of structurally unemployed people who can be exploited for very low wages. And the lack of any real substantive land ownership is something that prevents the ability to come up with certain innovative strategies that perhaps could give a deeper uh, economic underpinning to some of these areas and these communities. I mean, you know, it's 2023, it's complicated, but I do think that, you know, a strong cooperative movement on the land in the Black Belt of Mississippi, for instance, could be something that could actually generate funds and create jobs and revitalize many of those areas economically. But of course, you can't just do that because most of the land continues to be owned, you know, by large businesses, corporations, and sometimes people, both for farming, for recreation, hunting, and different things like that. So, you know, even in a period where most people are not living in rural areas, I think you can actually still see the impact of the lack of land reform post-Reconstruction on, you know, the present day realities of what Black people are facing in this country and the inability to use all possible methods to, to you know, shape, you know, our own destiny to some some extent. So I think the question of land in that sense is historically super relevant to understanding not only the failure of Reconstruction, but also the development of the Black Belt South over time and also the politics of the Black Belt South and how they've played out, you know, even still to this day in many ways and why certain people are in certain places. But I think that there's also an element to this that 
you know, sometimes can be a little too essentialized. I mean, I think that there's, from my point of view, no problem with asserting basically the same thing, that Black people have the right of self-determination up to and the right to secede. And the most kind of logical and historical national homeland is the Black Belt South. That doesn't really seem problematic to me per se, although I think to some it does. But I also think the question of land in the modern industrial age has very much changed, that even though I think, like I said, it has some impact on the economic reality of what's going on. I think given the urbanization of society, the bigger issue now truly is the socialization of the means of production. And in the same way that the lack of access to the land is what prevented or what, you know, really stunted the the Black Belt South post-Civil War and prevented it from really emerging in its own right. I think the lack of control over the means of production is playing the same role for Black people, you know, who are trapped in the ghettos of America. And that really the sort of direct focus on the struggle, you know, for control over capital is probably the centerpiece. And land is a form of capital, but I think more at the point of production is, is maybe more, you know, where we are now. But I do think that it's an important thing for us to understand in terms of the historical development of the nation. All right, on. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things that struck me reading the uh, sections of the book was that this work predates a lot of the really good the historiography we, we now have. Like, I think it's fairly common knowledge that at the time, Du Bois wrote Black Reconstruction in America, the general discipline of U.S. history and the Academy and popular representations were was white supremacist garbage. And so obviously some of the contributions in this book were written before that book, some, some after, but in either case, it represents some of the uh, finest historical work that was done in that period, even though the sex selections are not pulled from books that would have been considered history books. So even today, I would argue that this book offers so much historical analysis and as a historical document, it's still superior to most histories of so-called reconstruction or uh, segregation or even of the conditions of Black people in the South. And importantly, not in some desire to create a sort of not North good, South bad economy, but to understand the dynamics of history and, and the political economy as well as the analysis of specific conjunctures um, in U.S. history. So what would you say or what stood out to you in these selections in this book that fall into these categories of historical analysis, political economy, conjunctural analysis for you? And what they what do they eliminate or provide that was critical for movements? And do they still for you have importance today or is it more to provide examples of what was what doing that work looks like in entails? You know, I think they still have deep resonance today, you know, from a theoretical perspective. And, and that's in a way why I have so much respect for for what was done, uh, you know, at that time period. But I think that the thing that stands out to me and why I think they continue to be relevant today is they're rooted in, I think, maybe what the is the most important question, which is not always the question of historiography, which is, you know, not only why this is the case, which I think in and of itself is is important. I think a lot of historiography about things is just kind of telling a story. And, you know, the whys and the hows are always considered sort of, you know, subsidiary or there could be multiple things or whatever. But being very grounded in not only why this is happening to us, but how are we actually going to get out of it? And I think because of that, it creates a certain sort of subsets of analysis of, you know, systems, of structures, of capitalism in particular, of how to actually analyze capitalism, of analyzing classes and class strata, of looking at some of the key issues, because you're thinking about, okay, here's this thing and this is why it exists. Now, how do I pick it apart and deconstruct it? And since, unfortunately, many of these exact same systems and structures, even if they're in, you know, even significantly modified form, are still more or less still deeply rooted in this U.S. soil, at the end of the day, it still offers great insights to how we address and look at some of these different points and how we start to grapple with the very unique and particularistic history of Black people here in America, but also then situate it in not just a national or regional, but also in an international context in terms of understanding, you know, where the struggle fits into the broader struggle, you know, because if the ruling class is worldwide, which it certainly is at this point in time, that means the struggle is worldwide and sort of where does the Black struggle fit into that? I think a lot of these questions that are being raised at this time, which of course is the time of, you know, modernization, you know, modernization, Fordism, mass factories, all these different things that mark the sort of quote unquote modern world and modernity. So even though it comes at, you know, maybe an earlier stage in that process, it's still speaking to a very similar a very similar set of processes and realities and interests on the part of the ruling class that still speak to what we're up against today. And I think that, you know, the selections in the book do a very good job of, you know, mixing, I think, that sort of theoretical piece with some of the more kind of practical pieces about what work was going on, how it was done, how different things were happening, you know, and and what the sort of practical realities of 
the theoretical implications were. But I do think it gives us a lot to dig into. And I think it gives us a lot to learn from foundationally. And to me, it's really like a springboard for thinking about where we are today. Yeah, right on. So we'll ask one more question here and then give you an opportunity to close up. But, you know, really interested in kind of what to make in your sort of final analysis, you know, thinking through this whole book, kind of bringing it forward and and examining it, you know, obviously, towards the end of the book, we get Claudia Jones's piece, which is excellent on the right to self-determination for the Negro people in the Black Belt. We discussed this just a bit with Sharice Burdenstelli and Jody Dean last year, because it's I believe it's the piece that's also featured in their book, Organized Fight Win. It's a piece where she's really writing about the recovery of the Black Belt thesis, or she's, you know, advocating for that after it had been disavowed by Browder. And, you know, this was sort of the popular front, as we alluded to earlier. Obviously, that happened within a context of World War II. And after this, of course, McCarthyism really goes into full bloom and, you know, the Cold War. And uh, the CPUSA never really recovers the extent of radical organizing within the Black community that they had in the pre-war period. At least that's my analysis or understanding of it. So I'm curious how you assess all of this. You know, we could ask you, you know, was it the correct line, right? Are there certain adjustments or adaptations you think would be necessary to kind of rethink about it today? You know, was it a revolutionary strategy in your estimation? Just kind of what do you what do you make of it? Because obviously going through it as a study and putting it together, I know that you're somebody who thinks about this, these things deeply. And I'm interested in kind of how you, uh, you know, how you evaluate this history. Yeah, no, you know, I think that's a great question. And and to me, it still remains the foundation. I think that the core sort of illuminating facts of the Black Belt thesis are, to me, seem as true today as they ever really were. That there is a particularistic experience of peoples who were drawn together from all across the African continent into this maelstrom of slavery and Jim Crow and the brief, maybe semi elation of Reconstruction that has, you know, created obviously. And, you know, I always think about this, you know, no one would ever question that there's like a French culture, you know what I mean? And no one ever asks you like, are you a Merovingian? You know what I mean? They're just like, oh, you must be from France. But somehow, some way people consider like, oh, there can't be a black nation, even though no one would deny there's black music, there's soul food, there's black culture in so many different ways that we see it. And it's very diverse and variegated. There's no doubt about that, but like it obviously exists. If, you know, you need any better experience, you just need to go to any Black comedy show. The fact that, you know, there's clear through lines that, you know, you know are going to hit and that everyone is going to laugh at, that they're going to get you to every single time, I think speaks in a big way to the 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 reality of the truth of Black people being formed as a people. And I think in terms of the understanding of the relationship to of black liberation to socialism that to me also remains 100% true and i think that it's only become in my view more true subsequently as we've seen in the late 1960s um as we obviously have seen you know right now that there is a unique as i would call it detonator effect at the black liberation movement and to speak to this louise thompson patterson piece that was mentioned earlier it, national oppression is so foundational to capitalism that you really don't have to start asking for much until you are directly challenging the system and the state is going to treat you as if you are a, a mortal threat, even though what you're asking for is, again, to me, oftentimes very basic. Like you look at the 2020 uprising and the murder of George Floyd. I mean, how is it radical to ask that that not happen? I mean, that just seems like baseline to me that you just can't be randomly choked out on the street for no reason whatsoever. That just seems normal. But it turned into this great conflagration in the whole country because to really start to say, well, maybe there's actually something wrong with these police and these prisons. And maybe that the way that they're treating Black people should not be the way it is. It's like, well, wait a second. You're asking more questions than you think you're asking. And I think that that goes, again, to the sort of the core element of this, of the particularistic role that 
that national liberation in general, but certainly I think in the American context, the national liberation of Black people really does have a foundational role. And I think a sort of tip of the spear kind of role in any real concept and thought of revolutionary strategy. So I think there's all sorts of things, you know, within that we have to think about and work within. I think many of them are as much tactical as they are strategic. I think those are some pretty clear, basic strategic lines, but I think how to really actualize that, especially how do you really, you know, cross the divides of, you know, racism that have been introduced into the working class itself, all those things that I think we still are yet to figure out that I think there are still many questions about that we still need to do a lot of theory about. But I think that's the thing I like about the book is it puts me in that frame of mind, you know, having read it is like, okay, if this is the foundation, you know, where are the things we can learn from this history that things have been tripped up? And how do we maneuver and make that work? So that's maybe my kind of capsule view of of the book in some. Yeah, I appreciate that. And appreciate you for coming on and talking to us about it for, you know, you and all your colleagues and comrades for putting this together and putting this out into the world. You know, it's a great, it's a great document, a great collection, you know, and it also just, I guess, say a couple of things in closing, we didn't, you know, go through all of kind of the nuts and bolts of like, what's in this, maybe we should do a little bit of that to to kind of close. But like, it's a lot of kind of pieces of what we talk to. It's excerpts from memoirs, a lot of times from Black communists. It's, you know, pieces that are written in, you know, Communist Party organs or newspapers and things like that at the time in the United States. And obviously a lot more, but it's just a really great resource. And and as I was saying, you know, as we said throughout this, like, it, you know, there's a lot of really good just historical work analysis that's present in this book that I think we all can learn from in terms of just thinking about like, how do I create, you know, materials and analyses for movements that, you know, give people something to to grab hold of help direct action, etc. So yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say in closing, appreciate you a lot for this conversation and hope folks check out the book. I would just concur with you in closing, and I hope that people can read the book and, you know, questions, comments are considered. I think it's a great book to read collectively and to really think about. And it's a great jumping off point, you know, for your own research. And I would just make a plug for your local library. I did a ton of this research just by having a New York public library card and being able to get into the archives, the Daily Worker. There's a lot of stuff that's out there online. So yeah, don't just read the book. I think think about whatever parts really grabbed you and and see what you can dig into as well historically. And you can probably make your own finds and your own contributions to this conversation. Awesome. Eugene, thanks again. I appreciate you so much. Right on. Hey, thank you all. 